Welcome, everyone, to Teachers Talk Live, the podcast for K-12 solutions. I'm Oscar. The topic on today's show is one that's near and dear to my heart. It's a big part of why I decided to create the Teach Cow Network and our weekly panel of educators on Teachers Talk Live. Teacher empowerment, in my own terms, is the right for a teacher to have input and participation in the goals and policies that govern their own classroom and dictate how, they, how and what they are going to teach. Today we have some accomplished educators here to discuss a positive pr approach to make a path for teacher longevity with professional success and satisfaction. We will discuss what teachers can do for themselves and colleagues as well as their limitations. We will discuss what administrators can be doing to empower teachers more as well as their own limitations. Then I'd like us to look at the bigger pictures, the politics in education and how that impacts the overall discussion. We all have very different but important stories to tell as an educator. That's why I'm inviting live participation to contribute to the discussion through our chat. You'll find the link at teachcow.com backslash live. It's my hope that teachers, administrators, parents, and others invested in education can walk away from this talk with some great ideas and tools on how to empower more teachers, not only in their local campus, but maybe on a larger scale. Let's do more for education. Without further ado, I know you want to hear from the amazing panelists we have on the on today's show. I'm going to let them introduce themselves, and I'm hoping they won't be too modest with their wonderful achievements. So let's go ahead and begin with, uh, let's see, with Megan. Okay. Well, I am a third grade teacher in Daphne, Alabama. Um, I'm a national teaching fellow this year with Hope Street Group, and I'm a blogger for Scholastic, top teaching bloggers. Nice. Welcome. Thanks. And next, Edsel. Hi. Yes, uh, my name is Edsel Clark, and I uh, was an educator in public schools for about 15 years, uh, math teacher and uh, school and district uh, administrator. Uh, I'm now an education technology consultant and have started my own education company called My Own EDU. Um, I write a blog called What If Schools? Um, that really talks about challenging um, the status quo in schools and imagining what we could do if we uh, we stretched a little bit harder. Welcome. Thanks. Don? My name is Don Wetrick. I'm a teacher um, outside of Indianapolis, Indiana, and I have an innovation course that is unique. Well, I'm sure we'll get into that. And then I also wrote a book, uh, Pure Genius, Creating a Culture of Innovation. Welcome. And finally, we have Bethany. Hi. Um, I'm Bethany Hill. I'm an elementary principal in Arkansas, in central Arkansas. And um, this is my second year as an administrator, 18th year in education. I have been an instructional coach in the past, um, as well as a, a kindergarten, first grade, second grade, and third grade teacher, and also an assistant principal. And um, so I also love to blog and um, have aspirations of writing a book. Nice. So let's go ahead and begin. So we're here to talk about uh, teacher empowerment and um, what we can do. I guess the first question I would ask, um, I guess to everyone, if everyone can answer this, what, what is your definition of, of teacher empowerment? And anyone jump in? I think being bold. I mean, mm -hmm. A lot of times, uh, teachers usually were good boys and girls, and so that means we were we were quiet, we were attentive, we did what we t were told. But um, with that, sometimes comes um, asking permission too much, or or being mm -hmm. afraid that you're showing off, or not wanting to um, offend people with the things that you're doing. And, and the panelists we have on here, obviously, pushing the boundaries. So empowerment sometimes just means giving yourself the permission and and quit being so daggone humble. Right. I agree with that wholeheartedly. I think um, that teachers do tend to ask for permission way too much um, in general, and um, they need to be given the autonomy to take some risks and, and know that it's okay to do so, um, but to also be in charge of their own learning and be willing to go out there and... Um, look at research, look at current practice, and, and see what their kids need and, and be willing to try something different and new. So um, to do so, it needs to, they need to have that encouragement from administrators and even from peers. I, 
I would agree with all that. I, I had a mentor who um, used the phrase, um, I trust your judgment. And that phrase was so empowering for me as a young administrator at the time, being able to, to empower teachers by using that phrase and really mean it um, is so, so amazingly powerful for, uh, for giving that freedom, for giving that, that, um, that kind of blank checker or at least an open door to, to really extend the boundaries of, of what they can do in the classroom. Nice. So I would just have to agree and add on. I mean, I think teacher empowerment comes from a lot of different places. Um, so it can come from a coworker, it can come from your neighbor, but it can come from your administrator um, and your broader PLN too. So I think that there's just a lot of different paths and avenues to um, find your way in your career and in your classroom. So I want to talk uh, first about the the what you said, Megan, coming from your colleague, from, from another peer, what, what does that look like as far as that teacher being able to not be, not feel afraid? Where does that, where does that come from? Being afraid to speak up, being afraid to do something, you know, like you guys mentioned, um, ask questions later. Um, I think a lot of the times there can be a culture of that. How do, how do we, how do we control that? So for me, it's just as simple as saying, like, if you're, I'll show you how to do this. Um, if I'm having success in my classroom with something, um, and another teacher is like, oh, I don't know if I can do that. Okay, well, I'll come show you. I'll show you on my break, or I'll show you after school, or what can I do to help you do it? Um, and then I think just... Um, you don't have to back every choice anybody ever makes, but when you see people have a passion for something, um, like I recently had a coworker that really wanted to get into counseling. She was like, oh, I don't know, can I balance this? And you're saying, yeah, you can, and I will help you, and we will figure it out. So um, just being there to lean on and talk to, um, and finding solutions I think is a big part of it, instead of just feeding into, oh, this doesn't work, this doesn't work in a, in a negative spiral. Okay, well, if that's not working for you, let's figure something out. What, what's the solution we can create? <laughs> not mine. That one's not mine. <laughs> Let me move rings. Forgive me. <laughs> no problem. Uh, so I would say along with that, Megan, um, you know, my experience is that schools have traditionally been very competitive in nature, especially in classrooms, and it, it even gets into the kind of the, the teacher and administrative world um, as well. And as much as we can at the team level, at the department level, if you're in larger schools, th this attitude of we are in this together, your student is my student, so, so let's, you know, kind of drop those walls of, of competitiveness and and really help one another um, kind of raise each other to higher levels. I, you know, that, that's a huge piece to be able to empower one another through collaboration or through example or through just sharing of, of strengths and weaknesses. And where does that come from? The, the, what, you're, what you're saying, I told the competitiveness aspect of it, um, is that part of the climate that gets set up or is, or is that at the teacher level? What you do know, you I, I believe that's it's a huge part of a lot of schools, unfortunately. Um, my experience has been uh, primarily at the junior high and, and high school levels, and certainly when you get to like ideas of class rank and you get to you know valedictorian and, and, and that feeling of kids have to be kind of outdo one another, you're graded on a curve, that, that doesn't change when you become a teacher and you feel like, um, you know, I, I know who the highest rated teachers are and, and I want to be better than them or, or unfortunately, and I, I think we'll probably get to this um, later, you know, legislation when it comes to reductions in force and even the, the whole tenure process, it, it causes people to try to outperform one another for job security and, and that's just that's detrimental. It's like a cancer in, in, the, in the teaching field. And, and um, you know, I, I wish I could point my finger to exactly why that happens. I think it's a, a you know, kind of a pervasive issue that um, has lots of reasons why it, why it occurs. So I'm going I'm 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 to push, push back. back. Uh, uh, not, not because I totally disagree with you. Um, I, I do in some ways, but I, I also... Um, like a little uh, a little bit of competition just to keep me on my toes. Um, I guess a lot of it is in how you react, but 
it, it, it's also um, <laughs> I think when you when you do it under the filter of um, I'm doing what's best for the kids, and uh, I, I remember there was there was one time. And by the way, let me let me be let me be frank in saying I have no problem with charter schools. I myself am in a public school, um, but you know I was once asked, you know what what would you how would you feel if a charter school opened up in your district? And I and I flat out said I would love to see them try. Um, that's my competitive spirit. It's not that I don't want the kids that go to charter school to do well. I just want to know that. Competition makes me better, um, and, and I've got to give a quick shout out to Don Goble. I remember when I first got on Twitter, um, like I came back to, I was at a conference, and my my librarian was like, "Oh my gosh, you're on Twitter! You've got to follow this guy named Don Goble." At the time, I taught television broadcasting, and actually, I put this in my book, and um, it was so funny because she she's like, "Go ahead and follow him," and so I look at all of his stuff, and I'm like, "I don't want to like him. His stuff looks better than mine." I mean, it was. <laughs> Because we, I thought we did a really good job, and we did for our state. But Don Goble's stuff, like, looked insanely good, and so I was kind of like, I don't wanna. And she's like, you know, tweet at him, and so I did, and he re- tweeted back, and and then like within an hour, he like gives me this huge file, he emails me all of his shot sheets, all of his tips, all this stuff, and and that was one of those things that competition can also be a really good thing too, uh, if. And by the way, this is when I grew up. I mean, I seriously, I started off not wanting to like him just because I'm like, he made me look so bad. Um, but I think I do a little growing up too. Um, so then the, the whole transparency thing. And so I guess we as leaders, and, and, and I'm, I'm hoping that we're considered leaders on this podcast, but, you know, it's in our approach too, uh, which is my final rant. I mean, I, I don't like it when some people are preaching, be connected, be connected, be connected. But I'll only follow five people. Right. Yes. Right. Hmm? What? And that's a two way street. So if you wanna be, if you wanna like up the bar of, of education, that's great. That's cool. Just don't be a jerk about it and and uh, and uh, help out people uh, along the way. Right. So, so that was kinda like agreeing with you, but just a little bit. <laughs> so Don, uh, when 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 I hear what you're saying, when I'm thinking about competition, I'm thinking more uh, not competing with another teacher to outdo the other one for the sake of the student, but more like competing for the sake of getting favors from the administration. Yeah, or or, or God forbid, being. I mean, this is straight up Beach Boys, but you know, being true to your school, right? I mean, there's a couple schools in my area that I like to. I want to make sure that we're good, you know. And and again, and and not to say that that they're that the neighboring high schools in my area. I don't want. I don't Ill, wish any ill will on those students, but you know, I want to be. <laughs> I want my students to, you know, have that advantage. So and, and and at the same time, some of the other high schools. Actually, the superintendent reached out. I shouldn't name names. He reached out to us and said, "Hey, you know, maybe we could uh, have some of our teachers work with you guys." And I'm like, "Yeah, absolutely." So a little healthy competition is not bad. Just don't be a jerk. Right. 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 Um, so, so, Bethany, what about uh, from the administration point of view? Um, so you have, you know, say you have teachers like Don <laughs> on your group, and they're just being really competitive. How how do you how do you manage that, or how do you? Empower others. You know, you you have Don, who's clearly a superstar, and but how do you get the other ones to, you know, follow suit with Don? You know, do the same kind of stuff. Well, I think a lot of that it, it's it's the tone and the culture that is established in the building for sure, and um, the expectation of knowing that this is where we want to be, and we want to accomplish this specific thing or or achieve our vision but understanding that everyone is in a different place so in a way there's a sense of urgency because we expect everyone to get there but it may be a different pace it may be in different ways with different levels of support so um, I think that's what can help that healthy competition and um, what I have found is that transparency to promote that amongst the teachers I try to model that for my staff in the fact that I'm a learner 
always and always um, um, put myself out there to show uh, through my PLN, through social media, that I am trying to soak in information always. And I want my families to see that. I want the community to see that too. And so um, I think that helps open up the culture of learning within the building for adult learners as well. Right. And um, that way you have them wanting to go into each other's classrooms and um, watch them teach a lesson or um, find out, you know, why they're more successful maybe in a certain area than, than, um, than they are. So um, it, it, that kind of helps in a way. It's that healthy competition because they know that there are some people who are stronger than they are in a certain area. But at the same time, it's about our kids. It's the culture right. of our kids. And um, if someone is, is stronger in a certain area, then we owe it to our kids to find out what that person's doing in order to to be effective and um, and so it, we have to put our pride aside and we have to admit that we don't know everything and I think that starts ultimately it starts with administration it starts um, at the top you know with that because we can't display that we know everything because we don't yeah. and the moment that we try to act like we do <laughs> is the moment that we fail immensely and it sets the whole tone and culture um, or tone and climate for the culture of the building to allow teachers to be the same way right well said um, so I'm gonna be completely frank here uh, in the time that I have been doing this podcast teachers talk live I've had the fortune to meet all kinds of wonderful just amazing administrators teachers etc and the the sense that I get from doing this show is that there's these pockets of success everywhere but I hear from other teachers and other experiences where you know administrators like you Bethany are not there serving those teachers you know there's 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 these pockets of success with all this other area that's not being addressed and not being helped how how do we reach out to uh, you know other principals other other administration how do we promote the the kind of idea that you're talking about you know going into the classroom to help the teachers um, doing doing stuff for them so that they can feel you know like they are part of the school Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the the most important things that a, a lead learner can do is to um, promote the transparency of, of his or her own learning and to share um, you know the experiences um, that we have um, I am very connected in Voxer groups I'm in two or three different Voxer groups where I have really in-depth conversations with um, other administrators and teacher leaders and um, superintendents and even um, state superintendents or commissioners of education and um, I think that is is crucial and I share those things with with teachers you know that I spend some of my time talking um, at that level and to me it's higher than any and better than any graduate course that I've ever taken um, it's better than any six-hour PD or workshop I've ever attended. So um, even things like this um, panel right here, just talking through, um, it strengthens your core beliefs and your values, and um, and establishes that we must continue to grow and um, and chase excellence. And pockets of excellence is a big issue, I think, in education because right. um, our kids need more than pockets of excellence. They need it to be across the board. So. Right. And do you, when you do those boxer groups and the Twitter chats and things like that, do you feel that you are talking to the choir or is there growth involved and in, in maybe not, not only yours but in, in theirs as well? Um, you know, sometimes I feel like Twitter chats can, oh. excuse me, um, that certain surface level of, um, conversation you know mm -hmm. um, that may just last for that one hour and then um, everyone kind of goes on their way um, I know that you know everyone's in a different place too in those right. Twitter chats some people are in there and they're just lurking and they may never say a word but it could totally change their whole mindset and they may go and and um, make big changes the next day based on that discussion and we never know it 
Um, that's what I like to think that we can make an impact if we continue to express our voice and, um, and promote education in a positive way. Um, we need to brand it because, you know, it, it gets a bad rap. Public education get, gets a horrible rap. And that's what I encourage my, my staff and, um, and um, my colleagues that I, you know, my peers that I work alongside that we have to um, we have to be the positive voice and and let people know that there are great things happening in education and um, the the Voxer groups I think extend conversation. Um, two of those that I am involved in um, continue from a chat that takes place every week, and so there are always follow up questions and reflection questions and personalized questions to where we can. Um, take the situation or the, or the topic and, and internalize that in our own situations, but share that out with that group and get feedback. So I think that's where that true learning takes place, that true professional learning community. And that's my goal to get that in, in my building. You know, I, I'm a fairly new principal in this building and, and, it, and to empower teachers that way, to take, on, to take charge of their own learning and to use data to help them make decisions and but to also know what do they need to know and learn to do to, to make a bigger impact in the classroom. Nice. Nice. Um, anyone want to jump in? Etzel, uh, what, what is your, what is your view on, um, on the, the Twitter chats, Foxer chats, anything like that, as far as professional growth and empowering maybe uh, administrators to, to take on a new approach to open their minds a little bit about uh, what teachers should be doing. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I think we're, we're still, um, Twitter for educators is still kind of the, the, the leading edge. In other words, the, the educators that are really active in Twitter and following the, you know, participating in Twitter chats are still the progressive educators. We haven't hit you know, the, the majority of teachers yet that are really actively using Twitter. So in many regards, you are preaching to the choir um, in a lot of those conversations. But I would absolutely agree with Bethany in, in that, um, you know, s sometimes you pick up some new ideas, but at the very least, you, you leave those chats and go back to your school recharged and reminded that, that you are fighting the good fight, you are out there um, really trying to advance education, and, and that in and of itself be very empowering for teachers and, and, and for administrators. You know, certainly there's a great deal of sharing of, of ideas and, and just a new approach or, or even a way of, of saying something that can help you go back to your colleague and say, have you thought of it this way? Um, hugely, hugely powerful. But, uh, yeah, I, th I think we're still, um, we're still seeing um, that we're still in the infancy of, of high, you know, large-scale Twitter usage by, by, uh, by educators, I believe. Um, uh, Megan, I want to ask you specifically from uh, from the teacher's perspective because I know that you, I see what you do on Twitter, I see what you do on Facebook and everything like that, and I know you're an empowered teacher. What made you become that way? Because I know you're up on policy and all those things, and you're you're actually doing something about it. When did you begin that? What was your, you know... Your, your growth, I guess, your story. <laughs> well, um, I was really fortunate when I started teaching as a, not my original career, um, to land in a transformation school. And it wasn't so much that it was a transformation school, but the principle that we had in place there really um, took the time to um, empower all the teachers. I mean, there, were, there was a lot of turnaround and change to be made. Um, and in the time that I was there, we became the National Turnaround Model School. And um, so that kind of change and that kind of growth doesn't happen from the administrator doing everything and the teachers underneath. It had to be a school-wide effort. Um, and what that principle did for me was put me in positions to learn and to grow, um, put me in positions where I kind of had to go to certain things. You should say, oh, uh, I signed you up for this. Why don't you go find out stuff, bring it back? But she was doing that with everybody. Um, huh. She would take the person that you didn't necessarily expect to be the grade level chair um, and put them in that <laughs> position and then feed them, you know, not, not as a gotcha, but, but to feed them and empower them to be more involved and do that kind of thing. When she saw a teacher that um, 
maybe wasn't as jazzed about the big end of the year writing fair that we did on American history, she made sure that teacher went with them to DC the next time they went. I mean, different things like that so that all the teachers were finding places where they could be successful. Um, and then for me, um, that helped, just helped me identify some things that I felt really passionate about and it helped me identify some things that I really didn't care that much about um, so that I could kind of start following those things I was really into. Um, and she was also very supportive of finding funding for those kind of opportunities or if you wanted to go try for something, if you could do it, go. You know, she would she would work out the sub and that kind of um, that kind of thing because that's a that's a reality. Um, I think that there's a lot of administrators out there that are willing to empower their teachers, but they're also faced with a budget at the end of the day, and not everybody can just fly right. off to wherever and have a sub. So um, that's kind of how I started getting involved, and from that I kind of found the things that I was really passionate about. One of them being policy. So. Wow, sounds like you had a, you have a really good mentor. I did, uh, and yeah. you know, mentorship. And I was going to say that earlier is one of the really big things for me I feel really strongly about. She felt that um, we weren't doing enough to empower and mentor our administrators when they were first becoming administrators. Um, and then I had a great teacher mentor in my classroom as well, but we don't really do enough for those mentors. We, we a lot of times just say, ah, this is a good teacher. Why don't you check in on that new kid? Um, right. Instead of really having those teacher learners that are out there finding all their own stuff to, um, I don't know, help them to be a mentor to new people. And I think that we're missing that in administration parts as well. Mm. Wow. Um, Don, I, I really want to ask you about um, what you what you mentioned earlier about um, <laughs> doing something and asking questions later. Because... I, you know, I see what you do and how you do it, and it's it's awesome. It's amazing, and I wish that as teachers we had the liberty and um, I don't want to say you know the <laughs> the strength to just go for it and do that kind of thing. What what emboldened you as a teacher to start act? I guess acting up and innovating and doing that kind of stuff. When did that start? <laughs> Um, actually, one of my favorite stories is my dad's, and that's been said a lot of times, but, you know, um, yeah, my parents paid for every cent of my education, and three years out of college, I didn't like what I liked in my career, which, ironically enough, is why I like kids taking risks in education. <laughs> Finding out what you don't love is just as valuable. You can yeah. spend over $20,000 in a, in a college major and realize you hate it, so you might as well find out what you don't like in, in middle school and high school. Um, but, you yeah, I mean, I always remember when he said, you know, when I told him I was going to be a teacher and everybody in my family is in education, and I thought he was going to say no, and that was his, my favorite quote from the book was, Donnie, I don't care if you teach for the next 20 years, don't teach one year 20 times. Right. And so, like, every, I felt like every year should be different, and that was kind of the foundation of my career is that, you know, I've I've encountered some teachers that were teaching – one year 20 times and and I don't want to be confrontational but early in my career you know some guys were saying you know oh the kids don't like my class and I'm like dude you don't like your class <laughs> you you've got to be bored yeah you're treating it like the same thing year after year so what's up um, and and I mean I guess from a practical standpoint you know I, I I'm 43 and I didn't have the label of ADD but I'm pretty sure I have it me too. Um, so, like, I want it to be entertaining for me, too. I mean, I, I'm envious of my students. Like, I, I, wish, I wish I had my own class when I was 17 or 18. And so, um, and, and matter of fact, this is, like, I don't want to get anybody in trouble. I don't want to get anybody fired. <laughs> okay? But... Don't do that. But, but seriously, like, when you're taking risks, but you're doing what's right for students, it's not a risk. And, and quite frankly, you're kind of bulletproof because, like, I've had a couple run-ins, not at my current school, but the one earlier, and I'm like, you know what I'm doing is right. And I'm like, I dare you. Like, you know, I just, like, we're going to take these risks because I know how it's going to work out and the students are going to learn and the students are going to grow from it. And so, 
you know, we just did. And I've just never <laughs> been in fear of being fired. And even if I were to be fired, you know, it, I'll find something else, man. So I think that that kind of gave, and, and, and also just to be completely transparent, you know, my wife has a, has a good job. So if we got fired, I guess <laughs> I'm not going to be evicted or anything. And I, seriously, I got to say that. Like, you know, simply you're like, well, it's easy for you to say. And, and you're right. I mean, like, if I were really young, and by the way, I mean, I wasn't taking crazy risks when I was young, but, you know, later in my 30s, I was definitely doing that. But um, you. Don, I asked you this because because of what you just said, the taking risk because of uh, because your spouse, your yeah. spouse has has covers you, right? But yeah. I I have worked, you know, with teachers myself that uh, it just feel like they're in a bad situation and they're single mothers, you know, right? And they feel like I can't do anything about this. I can't no. I can't change my situation. Um, I, okay, you know. Fine. So here's the great equalizer, and, uh -huh. and I think everybody on the panel would agree with this. Okay, so there's never been a better time than right now. Okay, so like right now, I have more leverage over oh, a big company that if they ever wanted to screw my students over, they would have a price to pay because everybody would light that up on social media. If so, if you're young. And if you're a teacher, this is honestly one of the reasons why you should be connected. Because if you take some risk, and again, the risk is I'm doing what's right for kids, and we're going to push through, and we're going to do this. There's nothing people can do about it other than go, hey, good for you. And and I love crisis management. If by chance a, a inept administration without you, you can count on people like Bethany to go, uh, you are doing what's right for kids. You're putting yourself out there. You're being transparent. It'd be a blessing if okay. you left that school. <laughs> so okay, so I think what you're saying is being connected as as well as you are being connected and having your name out there because Don, you're really out there. You know, you have a book out. Uh, you have but, all these but, things going on. But, but if but if you look at my tweets and if you look at my book, what is my book about? It is not about me. It is right. about student success, which I guess and, and that's what I'm craving, right? Yeah. Uh, I and I'm not like trying to get like I, I there's <laughs> been some like really famous TED talks of people that haven't been in education for twenty years. That's cool. What I uh -huh. want to hear from is the people is like, you know, teachers that are like doing stuff. And they right. deserve, and then their students are like, "What? That's amazing!" And and then you know, all of a sudden, like you know, looking into Megan's elementary class, you're like, "You're doing what in elementary?" You know, yeah. and and then you know, taking a look at that stuff, and then going, "Oh, okay, maybe I don't need to." And and, and not that there's anything wrong with the people that have done some the TED talks that they're in their 60s and haven't taught in 20 years. I mean, there's no wrong with that. But it's really cool to champion the teacher that is doing. It's really cool to have that student voice and say, look at the kid that invented, you know, that invented the robotic hand and all these other cool stuff. Man, there's some, there's some things going on in education that are so amazing that we should give them the, the voice. Right. And so you actually work with uh, new teachers, right? Is that correct? Um, I, I did in my in a previous role. I was uh, oversaw kind of our new teacher mentor pro, uh, project, but um, I don't currently. Oh, okay. Because what I was going to ask you is, you know, uh, those those new batch of teachers doing what Don is talking about, promoting themselves as a as a brand and things like that. Is that, or I can ask any of you, is that being encouraged? Because, um, uh, you know. Going back to my past as a teacher, I you know I know certain districts discourage uh, teachers being too involved in social media or, or uh, public publicizing themselves too much. I, I'll I'll speak to that. You know I, I think it, it certainly depends on the culture of the district and of the school itself. Um, the the most recent position I held as an assistant superintendent, part of our new teacher kind of induction. Um, within the first half hour that you were there, make sure you have a Twitter account. You know, like that, that was one of the things we encouraged all of our new teachers to do to build that community across the district, um, even just as, as that team of teachers, right? Just automatically you have a, a, a PLN kind of built in. 
Um, and I think the other piece, and, and Don, you, you touched on this earlier about, you know, competition is great, just don't be a jerk. I, I love that statement. <laughs> and that's the same thing with, with being on social media, right? It's not about necessarily you as a teacher, um, you know, branding yourself, but rather showcasing the amazing things your kids are doing in class. And, and, and I think you'd be pretty hard-pressed to find an administrator that gets upset about kids doing great things in class. You know, I mean, even the ones that are kind of leery around social media or uncertain about how it can really be used educationally, like, if, if you're seeing kids do really neat things like, you know, Genius Hour and, and just doing amazing projects and create building things that, that we haven't even thought of yet, right? You know, giving kids that, that um, autonomy and teachers um, highlighting that, I mean, that's a, that's a win for everybody. It really is. Yeah. So um, I guess the next thing I want to get into is some of the limitations that um, you can have at the administrative level because that's that's something that teachers don't hear about enough, you know, uh, how they're being restricted. We talked about budget or, uh, earlier, but also other stuff. What What is some of the restrictions and uh, limitations that you can have at the administrative level? Well, <laughs> budget is definitely <laughs> the biggest one um, for sure. I mean, that's the one that comes to mind. Um, I don't, I don't think a whole lot in terms of limits, which sometimes can be right. a problem for me. Um, I'm a huge, um, I'm a big visionary, and so I, I have to have usually people. I have to place myself around people who will also think um, <laughs> a right. little more level because I usually can have the big picture but the little pieces that it takes and the steps that it takes to get to the big picture I usually I need help with that and that's and I, I'm not afraid to admit that and and thankfully I have a team of people around me that um, that think that way my assistant principal is is extremely that way and she keeps me grounded for sure but um, I would say um, definitely money is a big limitation. Um, time is probably the biggest um, limit um, too because I think we, we never have enough time to, especially for our teachers to have opportunities to learn. And to me, um, adult learning is, is something I'm extremely passionate about. And I have um, you know am trying to find ways for, for teachers to, to, to honor time for them to to be immersed in their own learning um, and their own growth and during the school day it's so hard to find ways to do that because um, you know we, we have to we have to be really strategic with scheduling and with um, the structure of our day um, to have t some honored sacred time to come together and talk as a team and to talk about kids you know is important um, we know but we do need that time too for um, for teachers to 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 learn on you know themselves and and yes they do have to go outside of their own um, work schedule and contract time to to do that and we all know that and Megan I'm sure you can attest to that that um, you know you 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 don't really ever leave your work it's always there with you all the time and um, but but I, I want to um, I you know am desperately always seeking ways for teachers to be able to learn in an embedded way in the school day right. and so to me that's a big limitation because um, I, I feel like we there's more we can do in that area and I don't know the answers completely to that I've tried a few different things but um, always looking for a way to make that happen to where we can have more embedded learning on site with kids and with with our peers with colleagues so I'd, I'd like to add to that, Bethany. I, I absolutely agree. Um, I think additional limitations, um, you know, for me when I was when I was in an administrative role, either as a kind of department chair, all the way up to being, you know, kind of an assistant superintendent, there was always this balance between um, kind of consistency versus individuality, right? And so when you have parents and you have community members that talk about um, over in this school or over in that class, they get this, and I want that for my son or daughter. And, um, you know, you, you can't have teachers that, that just come and go whenever they want to, teaching whatever they want to, however they want to, but it's also not right to expect everybody to be in kind of the same lockstep. And so where you draw that line 
Um, you know, frankly, as an administrator, I, I, I made bad decisions into where to draw that line sometimes, right? And, and, and I would have to be heavy-handed with some teachers who weren't following kind of the expectations, but at the same time, um, you feel kind of, you know, loosey-goosey and, and overly permissive when, when they're not following a, a, a kind of another set of, of standards or expectations. And, and, and that, that limitation of, of, of um, what the community and what everyone kind of expects compared to that individual empowerment of a teacher that you want so much in your heart, and you know what's right for a lot of kids, but you still have that, that expectation of, of sameness or of similarity. And, and I would think another piece that is just um, kind of an unfortunate reality of, of you know, schools is, is just the, the measurement, the accountability piece. Um, we know that there aren't great tests that measure every component of students' learning, but we have selected either um, validly or, or invalidly certain measurements, and, and those favor certain ways of teaching. And so if, if that's how a school or a person is going to be measured, you have to, to kind of, uh, you know, plan that way. And, and, and I just, you know, I, I think it's a really um, kind of dangerous place for us to be, but at the same time, it's a, it's a reality and a limitation that, that a lot of us have. But, you know, even if it comes down to back what you said, Bethany, which is funding, right? Mm -hmm. If you know certain things. If if you're not there, you don't you don't get those funds to be able to send teachers to great conferences. And so we have to really kind of balance and, and leverage you know one piece compared to another. Mm -hmm. Wow, well said. So so within that, how how do you balance? Uh, and Bethany, I want to hear from you too. I get I guess all of you. How do you balance that those requirements that uh, may come from even higher up than administration, you know, the, the state testing, uh, any sort of requirement. And what, what Etzel said, you know, you know, parents coming to you, hey, this other school's doing this kind of thing. How do you balance that, those, those requirements, I guess, with, with teacher creativity and individuality and basically keeping a staff that feels supported? How do you do that? Um, well, you know, uh, in in Arkansas, we have um, we have adopted Common Core state standards, and um, last year we used the Park Assessment, and then our um, legislature, the State Department, decided to switch. So we we literally this is our third year <laughs> with a different assessment because we had our traditional assessment before. We implemented something that was based on Common Core, and then we had Park, and now we will be doing ACT Aspire. And um, although they're very, you know, similar in nature, a lot of it is, um, the teachers are just like, okay, what now? <laughs> what are they going to throw right. at us next? And so, um, you know, my my goal with teachers, in fact, we had team meetings this week to talk about um, to talk about testing a little bit with our third and fourth grade teachers because those are the teachers who will be um, te giving the test and um, in our building and so we looked at it in terms of growth mindset and and how you know we don't need to be worrying about um, um, test taking skills necessarily or um, test prompt, prompts and examples and and, and and things like that as much as we do those life skills because those are going to we're going to get more bang for our buck that way um, if we can have that growth mindset um, in our kids to where they will persevere to where they will look at something and know that it's okay that I can't figure this out immediately that I can work through this that I may be wrong or I may make a mistake um, that I'm not going to know everything immediately um, because I think a lot of, of what teachers struggle with now are kids who tend to um, not be as resilient and um, and and aren't able to persevere through something difficult as easily as some in as in the past. And um, you know, my, in my 18 years of education, I see it becoming more and more of a problem. And and things like mental mental um, health issues with children and um, poverty and and all of those barriers that kids have, 
you know, we have to keep that big picture in mind and we have to keep that whole child in mind. So when the mandates come down and we know that testing is one of those things and it's not going to go away, the accountability is not going to go away. So what can we, how can we take what we need to do to get kids ready and to make them feel confident, but to also think of the big picture at the same time and make sure that we're doing things that will, that will be able to allow them to, um, to be successful in other areas, not just that test. So um, I always try to take take my my staff, my school family, back to that big picture of the whole child. And um, you know, if we're going to prepare kids for testing so they feel confident about it, let's make sure that everything that we do trickles over into how they can contribute to our school, how they can learn in literacy, learn in math, how they can leave our school and go out into the community and do things as well. So it's more about that student empowerment than it is um, preparing for a specific requirement that we have to that we have to um, complete or experience within um, the realm of school. Right, right. Anyone else need want to add anything to that? Um, Don, I had a question for you um, as far as I know that you go into uh, schools and speak to administrations. What what would you what what is the message that you bring to an admi an administration? And maybe if they're not completely open to the innovation that you bring to empower teachers to let them experiment the creativity. How, what's your sales pitch? Um, you know, it's it's funny. Uh, <laughs> sometimes you have to do it really delicately um, and actually sometimes it's best just to have like if there's if when I was a teacher and I still am a teacher but what I hated was an outside expert coming in and telling me what we were already doing and so I honestly the first thing I like to do is do a little bit of a little bit of digging and then like find a Megan right so Megan's already doing a killer job so <laughs> I'd sit there and I'd like a lot of times go like state the obvious like yeah because some of these things are already going on in your school like like see what Megan's doing here and because it's funny that a prophet in his own land's not recognized so in some ways just kind of show him that some of the cool things are already going on I say him I mean there, it could be a she too right. um, but that's one thing and then the second is um, I. And I'm not. I, I can kind of let them be a little less guarded when I'm like, okay, and this is what my students have done. Matter of fact, it's been a joy that some some of the conferences I've done are starting to invite some of my students. And I mean, they're really they're like like a lot smarter than me. And <laughs> and so they're like, oh oh my gosh, I see what's going on. Um, and then. Better still is if like I am working with an elementary. And by the way, like here lately, I've been working with like a lot more elementaries than middle and high, and I think it's so. Yeah. so but mostly because an innovative culture can be had like tomorrow with elementaries. Um, it's tough to convert the the high school kids. You know, they've been told sit down and shut up for a number of a number of years, and it's hard to break them of that habit. But it's really cool if I like so if I were like just theoretically were like going to Megan's school and I'd be like I'd I'd, like, I'd call her I'm like hey I dig what you're doing right so here's what we're gonna do we're gonna team up and you're gonna get some of your kids and and then, and then you know and then I'll like state what you're doing but like be on cue and and um and kind of win them over with and, and and like what school administrator doesn't like to be told hey you guys are already doing great um you might want to empower your Megans a little more. Huh? And so right. maybe that kind of works. <laughs> right, Megan? <laughs> she was muted, but she was going, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, yeah, so so that's that's awesome. And I'm glad to, to hear that you're working with more elementary schools because I think elementary schools don't get paid attention to enough with some of the innovation that comes through. Yo, they're, they're, they're ground level yeah. zero. They're not jaded yet. They want to take the risks. It's not the cool, not cool kind of thing. 
and you know it's just everything's pretty awesome and and it's like by third and fourth grade they start not liking school well right. they're not liking school because all of a sudden you took away their show and tell time you took away their I mean you took away the innovative things that they're already doing and 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 so um, that's just why I you know dig people that like are doing fun things at the elementary level and and, and I taught middle school for ten years and and um, and God bless those people that teach middle school, um, <laughs> because you know it, it, when we start taking away the fun, when we start taking away the experimentation, and really it's not middle school; it's like fourth, fifth grade that happens, or actually even earlier than that. But um, that uh, that all of a sudden they start liking it, and and, I, and you know what? That's another thing. I, I mean, I would also kind of get kind of put a mirror up to the the superintendent slash principal's faces and say, you know. How, how enthusiastic do you do your job when you know? How excited do you go, How excited do you get when you file your taxes? When right. you have to renew your license, do you really get jazzed up about it? No, because the environment sucks. So <laughs> if we have a class environment that is fun, oh my gosh, fun, fun, and and interactive, then then we then we'll rock it. And Megan, unmute your mic. I want to hear from you. <laughs> I actually yeah. heard. I actually heard some uh, research, uh, or saw some research online about structured time and how too much of it can be harmful for the students. And I think that needs to be exposed a lot more. Our Megan, team. yes, your input. Yeah, no, I think that's true. I mean, um, I went to the Exxon Mobil Teachers Academy, the Mickelson Exxon Mobil Academy, which is amazing. But it's centered on third through fifth grade teachers, and they did that because what they realized is if they wanted to make engineers, that's how young they had to start because that's when the fall off started happening. Um, and that's when the interest in math and science, when it started to get unfun. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really big part of it. And even at third grade, it's difficult sometimes to, first of all, carve out that time in the day to make, to make it protected. Um, but it's also difficult to get my kids to be like, no, this is you. You, you do you. You come up with it. You grow it. You do it. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, we have a makerspace grant with um, with a couple other schools, um, a hearing impaired program at Gallaudet and a uh, school in New Jersey and a middle school in Chicago and my school. Um, and we're all working on four very different projects. But in my school, it's just making sure that they have time and that they have some materials. So like for Valentine's Day, instead of Valentine's, we did Legos and they could build whatever they wanted in a certain amount of time and then show it off to the class. And it was funny. You could tell those kids that had been given that time and that space and that opportunity and the kids that hadn't. I mean, they were just at a loss as for what to build without looking at somebody else and they didn't know how to show what they made. Um, right. and so you realize how lost some of those skills are. Well, no, this kid's never going to be able to get up and talk about this research that they did or this project when they can't build me a Lego house and tell me it's a <laughs> Lego house. So um, I totally agree that it starts very young, how we, how we train our kids to talk to one another and how we train them to show off their, their different things. And I think with that, you know, if you're talking teacher empowerment, letting your teacher's classroom not look like everybody else's classroom every second of the day. If somebody walks in yeah. and I have Legos out, let's not assume that we're just goofing off and that it's not important work for the kids. Yeah. And, um, and don't be afraid then to, even if we are like, so there's a matter of fact, it's like Edsel's territory, also empowering the teachers that are curious about some of the fun ed tech tools to like, right. All right, you don't have to know everything, you know. Bring in Edsel, right? And 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 then and then like let the let the teachers have a play day and, and things like right. that too. You don't have well, to have all the them, answers. Let them explore their passions. I mean, I I always liked art. I always thought that was really cool. Um, there was an arts and education program here, but it was going to take a couple days out of. You know, I I agreed to go to three of the Saturday sessions if I could have three of the sessions as school days. Um, but I had tons of materials for my classroom and tons of support and people coming in from the local universities and stuff to help just because I thought it was kind of cool and kind of passionate about it. And so there was support there to do that. So I think it's important if you have a teacher that's interested in something, support them to go and do it. 
Yeah, well, God, God, God forbid we like our PD. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, and the reason that I'm calling this teacher empowerment is not because I'm not thinking of the students. I think teacher empowerment leads to student empowerment. You know, uh, with with the right kind of teacher, I think that's 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 essential. That's what happens when when you let a teacher uh, be creative and 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 create something new and original for their students. Yeah, I agree. Atmosphere. Well, I know like at our school, we're a leader in me school this year, so that's the um, seven habits of highly effective people. And the big thing that they keep pushing is that the teachers have to embody it first. Right. That if, if I don't take that in, if I don't take risks, if I don't take care of different things, then how could I ever expect my kids to do it? Um, if my desk isn't clean or organized, why would I expect them to have a clean, organized desk? I mean, just things like that. So it has to, you have to have your teachers believing in that too. Right. Um, so, Edsel, um, jump in at any time. I want to go through the whole panel, and I want to ask, because it's almost on the hour, I want to ask um, what uh, one thought that you guys have as far as a teacher or an administrator watching right now or listening right now to this what is what is one one piece of advice that you could give them uh, if they're afraid to step out you know they're afraid because because of uh, of their superior uh, they're afraid because they don't want to take a risk what uh, I guess from the teacher point of view and from the administrator point of view as well and anyone please jump in uh, I'll be happy to kind of kick this one off sure. um, uh, I guess I would point this this comment right towards um, kind of school level or district level leaders. Um, we trust our teachers seven, eight hours a day with a handful of kids. Sometimes it's 25, sometimes it's 150, right? We trust them with those kids' safeties, right? That's the like the utmost important thing to make sure those kids are safe and taken care of. Trust them with instruction as well, right? Just say, it's okay. Give them, give them a day. You know, kids are going to mm -hmm. be better off for it, but say, today, you don't have to teach the curriculum. You don't have to prepare for the assessment. Today is a day for you. Do whatever you think your kids need in class. You'd be surprised what that one day might produce in terms of culture, in terms of climate, in terms of teacher empowerment, but ultimately in student learning. Oh my God, that sounds awesome. <laughs> um, you know, I would say um, from a lead learner perspective to um, to don't get trapped in the office black hole. <laughs> um, it is so important to to be visible, and not only for the the school culture and for the children and for staff, but for the heart of an administrator as well, because um, a, an administrator should always have a teacher's heart, and it should, and and I always say I'm a teacher first. I will always, I am, and always will be a teacher. And um, and if if we if we lose sight of that as administrators, um, you know, we're we're in big trouble, and the people we are leading are in even bigger trouble, and that trickles down to the kids. So we have to um, to keep that teacher heart and to stay in the middle of where the action is, which is in the classrooms, because that's that's where the rubber hits the road, so to speak, um, and that's where we um, can be to provide support for kids and teachers. If we're not in the classrooms, if we're not involved, if we're not active in what kids are learning and what teachers are learning and sharing with their kids, then we are not able to truly lead a building. We, we can't know what um, is needed in order to get to the next level in order to keep chasing excellence and um, and and that's where we will have those pockets of excellence because the teachers who are Megan's will continue to grow no matter it. what. I love this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the superstar teachers are going to grow in spite. It's just like those really great um, you know, the really bright kids who are extremely intrinsically motivated in your classrooms, they're going to grow in spite of the teacher. 
Um, right. But so so teachers, superstar teachers, are the same way. I mean, they're going to they're going to push forward. But then you have those teachers who maybe don't have the confidence that um, that that our Megans do, or maybe they don't have the skills or um, even the right mindset to um, to achieve um, the potential that they have. Um, they just need a, the support of, of um, administration and coaches to help them along the way. And then you have the ones who don't necessarily need to be in the profession uh, to begin with. And, yes, um, and if we them. are not in those classrooms, then we don't know who those people are. And um, back to the safety of kids, you know, um, that is our first you know, priority for sure. But to me, the emotional and social safety and academic safety of kids is just as important. So if we are are allowing um, things to go on in our buildings without us being involved, then it's there. It's an automatic disconnect. And so my my biggest advice is to be out there and be in the middle of everything and be visible. Bethany, you you uh, you've made an important point that I don't I don't want to uh, I want to stress. You know that we didn't talk enough about those teachers that don't need to be there because mm -hmm. this is about teacher empowerment, but you know well yourself that not every person that goes into teaching should be there you know and I don't want to I don't want that left go unsaid so uh, Megan any advice for a teacher that's hiding yeah well I think for one thing you have to know what you're passionate about and I think that that it becomes easier for you to put your extra time into it and put your own learning into it and stuff when it's something that you really do feel strongly about, um, whatever that is. And I think that um, there's a lot to be said for, you know, the taking risks, for sure. But um, like Don was saying, if you are doing the right thing for kids, it's going to be really hard to have anything to say about that. And I think if you approach it from the um, side of things like – yes, this is what I want to do, but I'm not doing it to make my life easier, right? I'm not doing it to just go kick off and have fun. I'm doing it because it's benefiting you, it's benefiting the school, it's benefiting the kids. Um, you're more, more likely to get people on your side um, attacking things that way. So go for it. <laughs> Don? Uh, when all else fails, just, quit, just quote uh, Whitney Houston. <laughs> No, I believe the children are our future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. No, um, yeah, I mean, to empower your teachers. I mean, I uh, look, I mean, a lot of people that are listening to your podcast are taking time to do even more professional development. Um, right. The people you see at ed camps are taking time to be doing professional development. The people that are on Twitter, you know, I, I just don't want it to be an echo chamber. You know, back when I was a young, young, and you know, um, my mom would even say, you know, faith without works is pointless, right? So you arm yourself with all this professional development, and you and you do what with it? Well, back to the point of, you know, it, it's great um, if you're a little bit competitive, but it's awesome if um, if you see teachers around you that are struggling, um, that uh, take the journey with them. Um, we throw around the term lifelong learner, but I, I have to think that it's kind of a cliche. Um, challenge yourself to, to do something totally new with your kids. You know, mm -hmm. uh, if you're in grade school, learn how to work in Arduino or, God forbid, learn how to, you know, the gateway drug to Genius Hour, do Minecraft. Or, you know, I, I, I remember when, you know, I was, I was teaching broadcasting and there was so much new equipment coming out that I didn't know what I was doing. And I'm like, hey, guys. I have no idea what I'm doing. Who wants to do some fun stuff? So, you know, taking those taking those uh, chances to learn and, and grow anew. And if you're doing great, taking those chances to help out the teacher next door to you so they can be great too. Yeah. And don't be afraid, right? Yeah, man. <laughs> okay, so you guys, it seems like we've come to an end of another show. So I really want to thank you guys for being on. We've been talking about uh, teacher empowerment. And if you guys have anything else to add to it, just go to teachcout.com and look for this episode and add to the comments. So yeah, thank you for watching. Fantastic. Great. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah.